Ja, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon to South Korea. Welcome to the event on the uh, future of multilateralism. It is my deep honor and utmost pleasure to open this event. It gives uh, the platform to highest level and most esteemed speaker on the topic. His Excellency Ban Ki Moon, former United Nations Secretary General. My name is Mika Altola, Director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Pia's key mission as a research institution at the European Forefront is to, uh, besides high caliber academic research, is to support public discussions and give, give advice to decision makers. This event, speakers, and its audience today proves that the mission can be accomplished. Dear audience, uh, we rely on the orderly fabric of global multilateralism and effective governance institutions. As COVID-19 demonstrates, there can be no comprehensive national solutions to global challenges. We need fully functioning global governance institutions instead of going alone approaches. The scope of multilateralism has expanded. Serious structural challenges such as climate change, information technological revolution, dynamics of globalized economy have placed heavy demands on the resources of international governance. Besides these emerging expanded areas where order, security and justice are in great demand, the core issues of global order is under pressure as well. Challenges of war and peace need to be tackled, managed and solved. However, the increasing great power competition is reducing the likelihood of finding common sense in these acute issues. <laughs> Moreover, it, it appears that our time can be regressive rather than progressive. Power political competition is engulfing the domains of emerging and expanded areas such as cyber, digital domain and global trade. The event today seeks to find answers to the, uh, to the key questions of multilateralism. Is multilateralism in crisis or in a state of transformation? What kind of in initiatives can strengthen multilateralism? Ladies and gentlemen, the chair of today's event is Under Secretary of State for Foreign and Security Policy and Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland, Mr. Kai Sauer whose career has crossed paths with the global governance institutions and themes at multiple occasions. Mr. Kai Sauer, I will now yield the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mika, and good morning and good afternoon. And it's, it's so, so good to see you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you at the at this webinar of the Finnish Institute for International Affairs. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, President Tarja Halonen, former Prime Minister Anneli Äätteenmäki, former Foreign Minister Erkki Tuomioja, and former Minister of Development uh, Lenita Toivakka, all old friends of you, Mr. Secretary General, and uh, friends of multilateralism. Furthermore, I would like to welcome two former Finnish ambassadors to the UN, Ambassador Klaus uh, Törnud and uh, Ambassador Jarmo Viinanen. We have uh, also a large number of uh, ambassadors and representatives of the Helsinki diplomatic uh, community joining us this morning, including the representative of the Republic of Korea in Helsinki, Ambassador Cheon, and of course the Finnish ambassador to, to Seoul, uh, Pekka Metso. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, according to my count, this is at least your fourth uh, visit uh, to Finland. You visited the ASEM summit in 2006 as a foreign minister. Then as a UN Secretary General, you visited uh, Helsinki twice. And now we have the pleasure to welcome you as the co-founder of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens and as the vice chairman of the elders. 
I remember that your last visit to Finland took place in December 2015, and it was to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Finland's UN membership. But that visit of yours was sandwiched between your two trips to the Paris climate uh, meeting. So you arrived to Helsinki from Paris, and after your program in Finland, you left back to Paris. And I think this is signifying the importance of your personal role and the role of the United Nations in achieving the Paris Agreement. As a matter of fact, it is stated that your second term as the UN Secretary General coincided with the last two big achievements of multilateralism, one of them being the Paris Climate Agreement and the other one being the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. After these two major accomplishments, it has been rather quiet on the multilateralism front and the steps which have been taken have been steps backwards instead of forwards. This morning in Helsinki, we would very much welcome your assessment, Mr. Secretary General, of the future of multilateralism and the future of the rules-based international order. Over the past years, these structures of multilateralism have been under tremendous stress, but they remain critically important for keeping our global house in order, which in turn is of particular interest to smaller countries like Finland. So with this introduction, Mr. Secretary General, it is my great pleasure to invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kai Sauer, Under Secretary of State, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland, uh, for your very kind introduction. I am uh, deeply grateful and very happy uh, to see you again in uh, good, good health. Uh, Thank you for your invitation. And I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Mika Altola, director of FIIA, uh, for organizing this very important uh, occasion. And uh, I understand that uh, uh, President uh, Daria Halonen is uh, with us. And I'm particularly honored and pleased to see uh, President Halonen, for whom uh, I have uh, deep respect and I thank also former prime ministers and foreign ministers and many uh, diplomatic corps ambassadors for uh, your participation. This is a great opportunity for us to uh, discuss uh, how we can strengthen further the multilateralism which was uh, for a time being for a few years under uh, threat or in disarray in addressing um, global uh, challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great uh, privilege to deliver uh, these uh, virtual remarks on the, this topic at such an important juncture for all of us. I was uh, scheduled to participate in person, but somehow because of this COVID-19, I have to uh, give up and I'm joining through this uh, virtual means this really means that we are in a serious uh, crisis. Indeed, we currently stand on the precipice of a period of great change, one that will have profound implications for the future of ourselves, our communities, and even our planet Earth. As such, the theme of this webinar is quite timely. You are serving an essential role by hosting this FIIA in facilitating crucial interactions between the international think tank and research community and the public sector. This is incredibly important during this period of great uncertainty and change, one where we need to have a strong civil society engagement to work together in partnership with governments and other key stakeholders 
in order to respond to the pressing challenges of both today and tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we stand at the center of a variety of converging global crises and increased uncertainty. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to append our economies, societies, our lives, and all security. Meanwhile, climate change is worsening with the superstorms, extreme heat, flooding, wildfires, and droughts all expanding in both frequency and intensity. COVID-19 has underlined the interconnectedness and also offered us a glimpse of the possible uh, global disruptions that will arise from climate change in the near future. These include, but not limited to, mass migration, increased conflict, elevated public health risks, turmoil to supply chains, and protected economic crisis. Both pandemics and climate change are inherently global issues, which requires a strong multilateral response and increased international cooperation. Under this backdrop, I firmly believe that we must elevate our sustained efforts to reinvigorate multilateralism in order to historically or holistically address the inherently global challenges of both today and tomorrow. No country is an island in today's increasingly interconnected world, one where trade, technology, and tourism continue to bring us ever closer. Despite an increase in nationalist isolationism in recent years, our biggest challenges remain in intrinsically global. Wars are simply no match for viruses, wildfires, cybersecurity attacks, and other transitional threats. As such, we require a solution underpinned by multilateral cooperation, sustainability, inclusion, and partnership. Under this backdrop today, I am excited to speak more about the great importance of reinvigorating and building a more inclusive multilater multilateralism, one that is a fit for purpose to steer our collective future. First, I will underline the critical role of the United Nations in this process, as well as offer some concrete recommendations that the organization should pursue. Second, I will discuss necessity of achieving UN SDGs and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change to help anchor and enhance multilateral cooperation at this time when it is greatly needed. And third, I will highlight the utility of some forward-looking, forward-thinking initiatives to help guide the future of multilateralism and a new path in a changing world. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, at a time when a global pandemic is raging, the climate change is worsening. Democracy is under threat. Crises are converging. It is essential that we elevate cooperation in order to persevere over the great challenges before us. But at the same time, despite the monumental challenges that we face, it seems like there is now visible high illuminating a way out of the darkened tunnel. After nearly 120 million COVID-19 cases and over 2.6 million tragic deaths, a variety of safe and effective vaccines are beginning to be distributed. 
multilateralism in disarray of the present Trump of the United States looks to be making comeback and has been boosted by the inauguration of new U.S. President Joe Biden with his globally minded actions, including the returning to Paris Climate Change Agreement on the very day of his inauguration. However, in order to holistically reinvigorate and rebuild multilateralism, the ongoing role and great importance of international organizations such as the United Nations is vast. And this is now more important than ever in aiding the global recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. With the United Nations in lead, our multilateral recovery from this pandemic and its secondary impacts must also combat climate change and environmental degradation to steer us to a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future. Indeed, we must build back better and build back greener by constructing healthier societies for all the people and our planet. And this is ever more important as the United Nations has just celebrated its landmark 75th anniversary last year. To lead the world on a brighter future path, the UN must leverage its unique strength and convening power under the banner of reinvigorated multilateralism. And middle power countries like uh, as Finland and Republic of Korea, my country, have a prominent role to play in order to fulfill uh, this vision. In this connection, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to the following five-point action plan that the elders, which I am honored to serve as a deputy chair of, issued late last year with a view towards reinvigorating multilateralism. It calls on all leaders to first recommit to the guiding values of the United Nations Charter. Second, to empower the United Nations to fulfill its mandate for collective action on peace and security. Third, to strengthen health systems, to tackle COVID-19, and prepare for future pandemics. Fourth, to demonstrate great ambition on climate change to meet the Paris climate change target. And fifth, to mobilize support for all, the U all of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm of the view that in this era of pandemic, division, uncertainty, planetary warming, we should urgently recommit to the goal 2030, agenda 2030, and sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. This will help us bring closer together build back better from COVID-19 and revitalize multilateralism when it is now needed more than ever before. During my time as a Secretary General of the United Nations, I strive to bring the entire world together by invoking our great interconnectedness and the universality of such guiding ideals. This was a particularly true in 2015, when I helped all nations and peoples agree to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Paris Climate Change Agreement. These were two, my two biggest achievements, working together with the member states. And I believe two of the multilater multilateralism's greatest recent achievements as well. Indeed, we are all in this together, and we all must ensure 
that the UN's global goals are prioritized all around the world as they can serve as a guidepost towards the construction of a brighter world and a better multilateral future for all. The pandemic has made it painfully clear to all of us that a new direction centered on health, sustainability, security, inclusivity, and prosperity is greatly needed. We are now one year into the beginning of the decade of action to fulfill the promise of UN Sustainable Development Goals and leave no one behind. This is one of the most important ways to synergize multilateralism to, to help build back better in the post-COVID-19 world. Unfortunately, however, many of the hard-won development gains over the past few years are now in danger of being lost. We are seeing traveling reversals as a result of COVID-19 and its economic and societal aftershocks of a multitude of SDG targets. At the same time, the pandemic is amplifying existing inequalities in healthcare, labor, education, housing, food, gender, and other key areas. As such, urgently expanding multilateral cooperation and elevating multi-stakeholder partnership efforts on the SDGs and climate action would help enhance social inclusion in both the pandemic and post-pandemic world. Doing so also advance, would advance human rights, boost the sustainable growth, promote gender empowerment, fortify public health, scale up education, and much more. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Despite the return to great power com competition in global politics, I think we are likely to see a shift towards a more multipolar world in the post-COVID-19 future. And this will provide opportunities for other countries and groups to pick up the mantle of global cooperation and promote their own multilateral uh, visions. This obviously includes the Euro European Union, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany, and can be seen through productive new initiatives such as the German-French Alliance for Multilateralism, but others as well. For example, I'm of the view that the middle power and even smaller countries from geographically diverse regions who are all committed to a similar set of guiding ideals will have a prominent role to play in defining our multilateral future. These guiding ideals include ensuring peace and security, promoting sustainable development, protecting human rights, elevating healthy societies, empowering women, catalyzing climate action, and enhancing democratization. In this connection, countries such as Canada, Republic of Korea, New Zealand, Costa Rica, and the Nordic countries, including Finland and others, will be afforded a unique opportunity to help lead our common multilateral future. We can see excellent examples of this through the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, co-chaired by Finland and Chile, as well as the UN-based and Korean-led group of friends of solidarity for global health security. Such initiatives can not only reinvigorate multilateralism today, but help build a future that is cooperative, peaceful, inclusive, and sustainable for all people 
and our planet. We must remember that in our interconnected world, global problems can only be solved through global solutions. Populist nationalism, great power competition, and isolationism are simply not viable alternatives to cooperation and partnership. Major crises such as pandemics and climate change clearly demonstrate this. COVID-19 will not be defeated by individual nations, nor will our deepening climate crisis. International cooperation is the glue that binds us all together, and the UN system remains as a cornerstone. As such, we must reinvigorate multilateralism with the UN in the lead and its global goals as our roadmap to help to build back better, help proper climate action, and steer our planet and humanity towards a more viable trajectory. Fundamentally, our recovery from this pandemic synergized by elevated multilateral action must guide us to a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future for all people and our planet. It must be more inclusive to ensure that no one is left behind, including marginalized communities and the most vulnerable. It must be more sustainable so we can build our economies and societies back greener and simultaneously combat worrying air, air quality levels, biodiversity loss, CO2 emissions, extreme temperatures, and ecosystem damage. And it must be more resilient in order to give humanity and our planet the right tools to confront the next major pandemic, security crisis, humanitarian disaster, or environmental tipping point. Empowering women and young people and elevating importance of global citizenship is critical in this regard. We simply will not be able to create the future we want without women and the youth dynamically leading us forward together. As such, we must do much more to scale up their rights, empowerment, participation, and leadership capabilities to forge a more equitable, peaceful, sustainable, and prosperous post-COVID-19 multilateral world for Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. At the beginning of 2021, and now in the second year of this pandemic, we find ourselves living in an unprecedented times. But times can offer unique opportunities as well if we come together under the guiding principles of multilateralism with an equally unprecedented response. In this connection, I firmly believe that we have generational opportunity to build back better, help synergize climate action, and steer our planet and humanity towards a more sustainable and inclusive multilateral future. With your continued active effort to this end, I am confident that we can harness this pandemic as a gateway to a brighter world for all. Ladies and gentlemen, let us work together to make this world better for all. This is our moral and political responsibility for our succeeding generation, for our humanity and our planet Earth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency uh, Secretary General, for your wise and uh, inspiring words. Uh, next, uh, we are moving to uh, experts' comments. Uh, we have uh, uh, the leading research uh, fellow of uh, FIA, Dr. Katja Kreutz, and uh, Professor Hiski Haukala from the Tampere University. And uh, 
uh, that uh, section will then be followed uh, by a few questions to you, Mr. Secretary General. But first, uh, Dr. Kreutz, you have the floor. Five minutes. Your Excellency, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Under Secretary of State Sauer, Director Altola, and Professor Haukala. Ladies and gentlemen in the virtual audience, it is an honor for me to provide comments here today both as a researcher and as a global citizen. Our discussion here today, as well as Finland's effort to strengthen multilateralism, shows that multilateral cooperation is in a low point, despite some light at the end of the tunnel identified by His Excellency in his speech. I want to pick up on the disarray of multilateralism mentioned by His Excellency, the Secretary General. I want to address the issue of where exactly the crisis of multilateralism is located. The future of multilateral cooperation is often discussed against the backdrop of shifting power relations. Through the rise of China, US hesitance to defend the international liberal order, and Russia's efforts to stir up international relations have contributed to multilateralism being anything but self-evident. But the real challenge of multilateralism resides elsewhere, in my view. The crisis of multilateralism is the gap between what the, ex the expectations are on ground and what the institutions of global governance have been able to deliver. Those who should benefit from public goods, such as a habitable and safe natural environment, security or education do not always see the fruits of multilateral cooperation. International institutions remain remote. According to the UN's own global survey, today only four persons out of 10 in Europe say that they see the positive impact the UN is having on them or their country. This is unacceptably low. His Excellency Secretary General Ban Ki-moon spoke about the need for inclusive multilateralism, mentioning the important work done by many governments, for example, in Europe. I want to highlight the need for diverse actors. We need actors who can bridge the gap between institutions and people, those who make public goods reality at the local level, and those who act as watchdogs. We need cities and mayors. We need civil society, activists, businesses, and perhaps even academics. In addition, we need women and youth, precisely as His Excellency said. We, the peoples, need to be better heard and reconnected <laughs> to decision makers, whether we talk about the UN or the G20. UN has taken steps to improve its inclusiveness. At its 75th anniversary, the global conversation was launched, seeking through online global surveys and dialogues to chart the opinions of people around the globe. I participated myself in these online surveys. Technology enables the world to speak, even in times of a global health crisis. And the people from Nigeria to Lebanon and Tajikistan are remarkably unified People's longer term concerns relate overwhelmingly to the climate crisis and the natural environment. It is within this branch that multilateral cooperation foremost must produce results in order for multilateralism to become stronger. This connects to my second point, which is that multilateralism should not be discussed in the abstract. Multilateral processes may generate bad results similarly to unilateral ones. One prominent example is found in the Responsibility to Protect mission in Libya in 2011. The process alone does not guarantee that community interest will be respected. We should therefore connect the discussion on multilateralism with concrete policy goals, as His Excellency the Secretary General did here today when speaking about the Sustainable Development Goals and the objective of the Paris Agreement. When we put multilateral cooperation in a policy context, 
it becomes easier to realize that in many issues, multilateralism is not only an option, but something that is arguably required by international law. International law necessitates multilateral cooperation in a number of different situations, be it territorial disputes, managing common resources, or preventing mass atrocities. And if major powers forget that, we need countries such as Finland or the Republic of Korea to remi remind them about the importance of multilateralism. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kreutz, for your thought-provoking um, intervention, which also shows that the uh, research community is not far from the policy-making uh, community, so we can definitely complement uh, each other's. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, my good uh, colleague and, and friend, uh, Professor Hiski Haukkala uh, of the Tampere University to take the floor. Hiski, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your Excellencies, dear friends, a lot of wise words have already been uttered today, and, 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 and I would like to take this opportunity to to voice my support to the, the strong rallying call uh, made by Mr. Secretary General uh, in his opening remarks. I, I, I think they were, it was an important message and we all should pay heed. Uh, what I would like to do in my short remarks is to draw attention to the, what I would call the inherent tension between the hardware and software of multilateralism and our everyday global realities as they unfold uh, before our very eyes in, in, in the daily, daily interactions between the peoples of the world. Starting with the hardware, you could argue that the, our institutional structure of multilateralism and our institutional structure of cooperation dates from the early 20th century, even to a certain extent late 19th century. And, and it's predicated on, 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 on working methods that were suited for the time and 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 um, built on on a sort of an established historical practice, and the institutional structure of today is basically based on perennial and at times very cumbersome conference diplomacy. It is based on less than agile global bureaucracies, massive international organizations, and it is based on the idea that there is a privileged role for great powers when it comes to international politics and multilateral cooperation and diplomacy. And, 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 and this is the one part of the, of the story, is this institutional hardware of multilateralism within which we are operating here today. If I may turn to the software of multilateral diplomacy, that is even older you could argue, with some simplification, that it that dates from the mid-17th century. You could go back all the way to 1648 and the Treaty of Westphalia and the idea of sovereign uh, states and the primacy of sovereignty in international politics to begin with. And already you can see that these two things exist in a very uneasy coexistence, the institutional hardware and the sort of the diplomatic software of multilateralism. Our added problem is that we do not live in the early 20th century, let alone the mid 17th century, but we live in the 21st century. And for large part, we seek to tackle today's challenges with old structures, old mindsets, old ideas, and to a certain extent, old solutions. Whether we like it or not, uh, globalization is a fact of life and the interdependence that flows from globalization is real and growing, and I would argue enduring. More than that, the interdependence that binds all of humanity together is equally strong and growing day by day. We see it in the pandemics, we see it climate change, the loss of biodiversity, technological change, and so on and so forth. We are all in this together. Yet for the most part, when we try to understand international politics and global challenges, we look at things from the national prism. We look at things like cross domestic products, the national interest, and so on and so forth. And these are not uh, perfectly suited 
uh, for for solving the, many of the current situations and challenges the humankind is increasingly witnessing here today. Yet, it is not realistic to think that we can simply jump into a new reality, install a new software or some kind of a software patch and move ahead towards more effective global multilateralism and cooperation. Therefore, I would argue and contend we have to make do with what we have got. And that basically entails that we have to fall back to the multilateralist practices and, and systems of operation as we have here today. But here is the problem that I now foresee and, and was already touched upon by many of the comment, uh, this, uh, many of the remarks we have heard today. Great power competition seems to be entering very strongly into the scene and that turns multilateralism into an area of competition and even conflicts. The solutions are lost in the process. And so what I fear personally as, as an analyst of international politics is that we will have a quite, quite probably a very hard time ahead on a global level. And I do not foresee an easy or natural progression for multilateralism going forward. The silver lining, and it is a very thin, thin silver lining, to be honest, is that the current crisis and the future crisis of multilateralism that I foresee provide us with pedagogical opportunities. They are always crises for the humankind, crises for the multilateralism, but they are also opportunities to learn and to make better choices going forward. And I hope we can seize these opportunities and learn. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Haukala, for your very uh, clear, clear words. Um, and just uh, uh, from my side, a brief, brief comment uh, and observation. I, I think uh, uh, the recent uh, UN Secretary Generals, they have uh, spent a good uh, portion of their time and uh, limited political capital to uh, reform the hardware of the UN system, uh, which uh, you referred to but they, they are limited uh, in, in their capacity to um, exercises uh, or complete the reform because of the UN Board of uh, Governors, uh, which consists of uh, 193 members, doesn't allow them uh, to do it. It's always a product of uh, consensus. But uh, th thank you, uh, that was inspiring. And uh, we move uh, forward. Uh, we are going now to the questions uh, section, uh, which is uh, led uh, by President uh, Daria Halonen. Madam President, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to, wonderful to see old friend like Ban Ki Moon you here even with uh, with this this time of the team discussion. So um, as it has mentioned already by you and the others, the COVID nineteen pandemic has demonstrated very concretely the importance of understanding security in a more comprehensive way. Uh, health has become a central security consideration. At the same time, this pandemic has demonstrated the importance of collaboration and multilateral solutions. Um, we have said that no, uh, no one country can defeat this pandemic alone and in this interconnected world. And um, so, of course, this is, this is an old slogan already, you know this, that this, this is already uh, what health organization has said. Uh, uh, this is the one health, one world idea. Uh, but um, how um, can we turn this understanding into concrete results in strengthening multilateralism? I think that um, um, the lesson of the COVID has been that the importance of collaboration, particularly in health sector, has become very visible. And um, just yesterday, um, the World Health Organization, Pan-European Commission, where I'm also the member. So uh, we have uh, uh, led our call for action, where also it has been mentioned uh, that whether we could get an, uh, an climate panel type of the, uh, of the system for the health sector. So um, 
climate panel has been a very, it has been a great success in um, spite of the difficulties. So could it copy it for copy it for the for the health sector? Thank you, Madam uh, President, for for your question and. Uh, I give the floor back to uh, Secretary General and uh, Mr. Secretary General, just uh, remember to open your mic uh, again when you take the floor. Please, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, Mike, yes, okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Kreutz and uh, Professor Haukala uh, for their very insightful uh, comments, which I uh, completely agree on how to strengthen the UN's capacity. And also, uh, as I briefly mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm very much pleased to see uh, uh, President Daria Halonen again. Uh, I think uh, you are one of the leading uh, politician, political leader in um, trying to make multilateralism really work. Uh, one good example was that uh, in uh, 2010, August 2010, uh, you, you presided over a global sustainability panel together with uh, President uh, Zuma of South Africa. Of course, in that, uh, in that panel, uh, there were many, about uh, 20 distinguished uh, political and business leaders, including uh, uh, former Prime Minister of Korea and Japan, etc., etc. Even Sujan Rice, uh, Ambassador Sujan Rice was your member of the panel. And you also, you, you presented very good uh, foundations, foundation elements, uh, which later uh, to be adopted as a part of this uh, uh, so, Agenda 2030 and uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm always uh, grateful for your such uh, uh, contribution. Now, um, our multilateralism, if you talk about on health security, could, could go a long way uh, in this regard. For example, Korea also has joined together with other countries, uh, such as Canada, Denmark, uh, Sierra Leone and Qatar to establish the UN-based group of friends of solidarity for global health security. And there is no country in this world, uh, particularly dealing with the pandemic, we have to work uh, together. This group intends to help the world uh, respond to COVID-19 uh, through enhanced multilateral cooperation and sharing the best experiences and practices, as well as prepare for future health security challenges. This is a definitely important and needed one. Right now, achieving the most urgent task ahead of us also can simultaneously strengthen multilateral collaboration in health, ensuring equitable distribution of uh, vaccines and other, other medical support uh, and the fighting against the vaccine, so-called vaccine nationalism. I'm really calling on all nations, civil society groups and the private sector to enhance their support for the COVAX uh, mechanism in its uh, guiding mission to get vaccine to those in need. There are many poor countries who do not, uh, do, do not uh, have capacity to purchase these vaccines. We must remember that no one is safe until everybody is safe. That is something which we have to keep in mind. And therefore, I hope that the forthcoming uh, G G7 summit in London will discuss very seriously uh, how they can really make uh, all the countries them available for vaccines and other uh, medical support. This is one part of uh, multilateral cooperation. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, now, uh, we have collected a couple of uh, questions uh, uh, from, from our experts, uh, which mm -hmm. I'm going to read out. And uh, after each uh, question, uh, you, Mr. Secretary General, will have the opportunity to, to reply to that question. So I, I start with uh, Professor Haukala's uh, question, which is uh, the following. I quote, the UN is an indispensable global body, yet evidence of suboptimal performance and at times political sclerosis even paralysis is increasingly coming to the fore. What could be done to ensure that the UN system would work better? Thank you. End of quote. <laughs> For, from day one, uh, people were critical about the United Nations, the way United Nations uh, were doing. Uh, that means that uh, we needed to have uh, a complete uh, collaboration based on uh, based on global uh, citizenship. There were, of course, all the times during the last 75 years, power rivalry, disagreement among the regions and between developing and developed countries, etc., etc. Therefore, reform has always been an important and ongoing process to ensure that UN remains responsive to the geopolitical and humanitarian crisis of both today and tomorrow. I myself prioritize management reforms to cut through the bureaucratic red tape and increase the mobility of the UN staff. And I also made the reform in uh, peacekeeping operations because peacekeeping operation is composed of uh, so many soldiers from so many different countries, there needs to be some coherent, coherent way of uh, conduct of uh, their businesses. And therefore, I work to reform UN peace operations, particularly from their planning stage, and of course, not to mention about their conducting their missions. I streamlined the UN's work on women's issues and launched UN Women. That was again very important one. There was not, there was a very small, small sections dealing with human, women issues until I took my job. Therefore, I made the super agency appointing uh, Michelle Bachelet, the former president of uh, Chile, as its head. Then I think that was the beginning of uh, UN's reform and uh, empowering women. International efforts, I think, to create more sustainable and the peaceful world depend on accountability and the transparency of the organization. And therefore, leaders and government that engage constituents in decisions affecting them, those are something which I really uh, tried my best, but I found it's extremely difficult. First of all, it, whatever reform proposals I presented to the General Assembly, it was met immediately with some, some critical comments by the member state, and they were viewing the United Nations interest from their own national interest. That was very sorry, very regrettable. We are the United Nations, composed of 193, that we are working for global peace, global stability, global development. We're not talking about any one single countries. As I said, until everybody is safe, nobody is safe. Until everybody is sustainable in their social economic terms, then nobody will be sustainable. Therefore, we need to work together. That's the way. And if uh, I may add one more, one biggest challenge for the United Nations operating its mission is Security Council. Now, Finland has been a very kind initiative in 
you know, uh, conducting this, uh, so what is known as a Finnish workshop uh, for the incoming members of the UN Security Council. This has been UN's uh, tradition, UN's uh, tradition. Now how, how much united the Security Council member will be, will be the barometer of how much united the international community would be. Look at the case of um, uh, Myanmar. Nothing is done now while uh, more than 150 people have been killed. Security Council has been almost um, silent except the issuing pres presidential statement and also press statement. Therefore, member state must be very serious in trying to make United Nations accountable and workable and uh, this should be uh, transparent in their in their work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, thank you also for uh, acknowledging the Finnish wor workshop, uh, the the gre green uh, tree uh, retreat. Um, and you you just gave me an idea that uh, maybe at the future retreats uh, we need to uh, vaccinate the participants with the with the uh, <laughs> multilateralism uh, vaccination, uh, so That's to good. produce yeah. uh, better results uh, in the Security Council. Uh, I also recall your very bold um, uh, policy on uh, gender and uh, LGBTI uh, rights yes. uh, uh, yes. within the UN Secretariat. It's a rather conservative uh, uh, environment, but you you try to change it and uh, with some degree of of success. Uh. Um, I'm moving to the next uh, uh, question. Uh, we have uh, four, four minutes, so uh, this will be the closing, uh, closing question. As uh, you have been informed, uh, Finland is currently uh, preparing uh, some uh, guidelines uh, on multilateralism. I mean, multilateralism is an important part of our government program and also our, our uh, foreign and security policy strategy. But now we are trying to refine uh, 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 the policy into guidelines in, in, in support of multilateralism, identify a certain concrete uh, policies which we could pursue on the international uh, level. So what would be your, your advice in in, in uh, making this uh, process a uh, successful one. Thank you. I'm look, really looking forward to, to uh, your suggestion in your report. Uh, my key advice for approaching such a process would to ensure that uh, I think there should be a more, more contribution by the women, women's. Uh, so, uh, Empowerment of women will be uh, should be prioritized. Then more on a specific issues like, uh, I think you have been a key a champion, key champion, and I think a gender perspective underpins any guidance principles, any guiding principle for a holistic foreign and security policy uh, uh, strategy, and women and girls are absolutely essential to solving so many of the world's uh, biggest challenges. This includes uh, building peace and resolving conflicts and achieving SDGs and taking, uh, uh, talking about uh, climate change. I've been really fighting with the member state and even uh, you know, staff, senior staff, when I really wanted to appoint women general in a peacekeeping operations, commanding general as a peacekeeping operations, and also mission head, commanding United Nations as well as uh, peacekeeping operations. They, are, they have been working excellent, excellent job. And uh, Ambassador Kai Sauer, if I may add one more thing, uh, because um, about this uh, veto right, the veto right, this has been, I think, uh, seven decade long discussions. But veto power countries would not uh, give up any anything. But the French government once really tried uh, to persuade them to abstain or not to veto when it is a purely humanitarian ground, not political issues. 
You may remember that during the height of a Syrian crisis, even humanitarian support proposals were vetoed by one or two of the uh, Security Council permanent members. Then reform process should start from this. This is a high time now, after 75 years of uh, United Nations of founding, then if uh, veto power really blocks everything, look at the case of um, uh, Myanmar. There's not, uh, not a meaningful decision by the United Nations. Secretary General cannot do anything at this time. Of course, there are some problems on the part of uh, generals of Myanmar, but if the United Nations Security Council could send united, strong, firm messages, then that has been blocked all the times because of the uh, veto, veto threat. I, I hope this will be contained uh, in your report. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary General, for your, your thoughts. Uh, uh, very, very in inspiring. Um, and uh, we are, of course, sharing your, your frustration when it comes to the inaction of the Security Council uh, because of the, the veto or ir irresponsible uh, usage of uh, veto uh, power in, in certain conflicts like Syria and Myanmar and, and many, many others. But uh, again, on behalf of uh, uh, FIA, on behalf of the, the Finnish uh, listeners and, and your friends, I would like to thank you again, Mr. Secretary General, and wish you a good evening uh, to, to Seoul. We very much appreciated your, your contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much for this honor, and I hope one day I'll be able to visit uh, uh, your country in person. You said the fourth time, but including my previous uh, personal visit, five times, five <laughs> times a visit to, uh, and I still remember how fondly and how nicely I spent my summer vacation as the Secretary General of the United Nations at the Presidential Summer Resort Retreat uh, at the invitation of uh, President uh, Halonen. And I thank you very much. I have always a very good uh, memories uh, as well as uh, good images and about what Finnish and Finnish people are doing. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, President. Bye-bye. See you again. Bye-bye.